By the end of the day on July 14th, the 48th motorized corps of the enemy advanced to the southeast of Berdyshov up to 20 kilometers, and the 9th Panzer Division, advancing from the area of Popolny in the morning of July 15th, took the city of Skvira. The 13th Panzer Division approached Fastov. Commander of the Southwestern Front General Kerponos ordered to strike at the advancing German units from three sides from the area of Kazatin to Zitomir by the 16th Mechanized Corps, from Vasilkov to Fastov by the 5th Cavalry Corps, from Bila Tsirkva to Popelnia by the 6th Rifle Corps. However, from the morning of July 16th, the commander of the 26th Army could launch a counterattack only with the forces of small divisions of the 6th Rifle Corps. The commander of the 6th Infantry Corps, Major General I. I. Alex Eve, in whose command our 94th Frontier Detachment was subordinated, decided to attack in the direction of the village of Maloy Polovsko and Popelnia Station. I remember well this new order. After a heavy battle near Popelnia, we spent the whole night and the whole next day, without sleep and rest walking along the road, and by the end of July 15th we concentrated in the villages between Fastov and Bila Tsirkva. In the morning of July 16th the border guards were putting themselves in order, getting ammunition, and in the evening we learned that the troops of the southwestern front were going on the offensive and we were to knock the Germans out of Popelnia. On our right were to advance 91st and 93rd border detachments, 16th and 6th NKVD motorized rifle regiments. To the left one of the divisions of the 6th Rifle Corps. Our offensive was supported from the village of Kovalevka Artillery Regiment. On the night of July 17th, we, that is, the 3rd and 4th Commandant's offices, as well as very few 4th, 7th, 8th, 20th and 1st Reserve outposts, were built in a marching column. The rapprochement with the enemy began. All night we marched through dales and forests, until at last, having overcome some rivulet, we came to a flat beet field to the west of the place Maloy Polovetsko. Our right neighbour advanced to the village of Trilisi and there, near a small grove, not far from the railroad, entered the battle from the march. While we were deploying, the artillery regiment from the village of Kovalevka made several volleys. The Germans responded with massive fire. Our batteries fell silent. At that time German troops moved along the roads from Popolnia to Fastov and from Skvira to Bila Tsirkva in an endless stream. We lay in deep furrows, covered with high beet horn, and waited for the approach of the 169th Rifle Division, with which together we had to fulfil the combat task. And on our right there was a battle going on all the time. Soldiers and commanders of the 91st and 93rd Border Troops, 6th and 16th NKVD Motorised Rifle Regiments, some units of the 6th Rifle Corp in the area of Fastov and Bila, Serkfa rendered desperate resistance to the enemy, steadfastly held their positions, although they suffered serious losses. They counterattacked the enemy and threw him back behind the highway Vasilkov Bila Tsirkva. The Germans struck back. The battle continued with varying success. Not long ago, I was tracked down by retired Lieutenant Colonel Sergei Lukyanovich Klimanov, with whom we served first in the 20th Slavuta Red Banner Frontier Detachment, then in the 94th. Just a month before the beginning of the war, Sergei Lukyanovich was transferred to the 92nd Border Guard Detachment in Peremyshal. Our paths almost crossed near Fastov and Bila Tsirkva. Klimanov was here together with the border guards of the manoeuvring group. When we arrived in Fastov, told S.L. Klimanov, there were already border guards of the 91st Detachment, and two days later units of the 6th and 16th Regiments of the NKVD internal troops arrived. The fighters told about the heavy fighting near Popelnia Station and Kotlyaka village. On July 17th we were ordered to advance from Fastov in the direction of Brusilov. There was an exceptionally heavy counter-fight. By evening we withdrew to Fastov. On July 19th the Germans tried to break into the city, but without success. Locks on the river Anava were opened, and deep ravines filled to the brim with water blocked the way of fascist tanks. All attempts of the enemy to break through our defence failed. A few days later, having pulled to Fastov considerable forces, Hitlerites subjected the city to such bombing and shelling that at night it was as bright as daytime. We received an order to leave Fastov and go to Vasilkov, where our armoured train stood. The fire of the armoured train helped to break away from the enemy tanks that were attacking us. And we, the border guards of the 94th Detachment, 
were ordered to arrive in the village of Elisa Vitovka. In this village we were not by chance. Having met stubborn resistance of our troops near Fastov and Bila, Tsarkva, Hitlerites decided to cut the highway and railway connecting these cities. It was best to do it at the station Astinovka, to which led a convenient country road, but on the way to Astinovka stood Elisivtovka, so we received an order to take the defence here. The country road entered Elisivtovka from the northwest. In the thick bushes of cherry trees stood two small houses. Ahead of them stretched a wheat field, and behind them, as if on a concave arc, the mud brick houses were hidden in the gardens. Bypassing Elisifovka was hindered by a deep gully, through which flowed the Kamenka River, which covered the village from three sides. The outposts were arranged in an arc near the huts and cherry plantations. At the entrance to the village a false battery was set up. It was made of cart axles, thin logs and plywood shields. Nearby dug trenches tank fighters border guards reserve outpost Lieutenant Alexei Fomenko. They were covered by a machine gun crew, commanded by Sergeant Mendrin. The section of the 10th outpost was in the centre of the defence at the house of collective farmer Dmitry Efimovich Pavlenko. To the right of Pavlenko's house, the soldiers of the 11th outpost were entrenched. Lieutenant Pyotr Anakin and his assistant junior political officer Nikolai Dolbilov, passing from one border guard to another, advised where and how best to dig trenches. Border guards of the 9th outpost, located to our left near the Pixty and stables, were also digging trenches. Lieutenant Pyotr Titov installed a hand machine gun in the attic of the Pixty, and Sergeant Ivan Sazikin and machine gunners Pyotr Zlotnikov and Ivan Markolov dug a trench near the stable door. Not far from them, the political officer of the outpost, Odesit Mikhail Edelstein, and Petty Officer Grigory Artemiev were chiselling the ground. Behind the ninth outpost along the gully took Defence Reserve outpost, led by Lieutenant Alexander Tikov. On the very flank was the twelfth outpost under the command of Junior Lieutenant Tikomirov. To the right in an arc were the outposts of the Fourth Commandant's office. They were commanded by Chief of Staff Senior Lieutenant Andriakov. Captain Andrianov was sent as a liaison officer to the headquarters of the Sixth Rifle Corps. The command post of the detachment was 800 metres behind, in a clay pit, where stood the only house in the village with an iron roof a school or village council. Four squad cars were also placed there. Lieutenant Leonid Ponomarenko, head of communications of the commandant's office, ran a telephone line from the detachment's CP. Then in the sunflowers signalers dug a small pit for the command post of senior political officer Korovushkin, who took command of our commandant's office, after the injury of Captain Gladkik. We were minding our own business when Dmitry Efimovich Pavlenko, his wife, daughter and young sons came out of the hut. Are you digging in? said the elder Pavlenko and sighed. Orders, I replied, realising that our arrival did not bode well. You are retreating, then Dmitry Efimovich said again reproachfully and put his hand on his younger son's shoulder. We are retreating by order. You do not take offence. I am an old soldier. Fought in the imperialist was wounded. For the rest of his life remained disabled. I understand what war is like. I thought maybe the trouble would pass us by. But no, it came here too. We had nothing to comfort Pavlenko. And he went home. His sons stayed behind. With inherent curiosity of children, they began to climb nimbly through the garden bushes to one and another fighter. The boys asked for a shell casing or a cartridge, for permission to hold a gun, to click the bolt. Someone asked them to fetch water, and they raced to the well. Having filled a bucket and taken a mug from home, the boys went around the border guards, offering to get drunk. Senior Pavlenko appeared again. His sons began to help him carry household utensils from the hut to a small cellar nearby. The children ran nimbly. The new work fascinated them, though they hardly understood well why their father made them carry things and dishes from the house. The border guards continued to dig trenches, and a herd passed down the street. Bells rang, cows mooed lazily. Nothing seemed to portend trouble. Sklyer came up, and we sat down on a bench near Pavlenkov's house, enjoying this ordinary village picture. Watching the soldiers arranging positions with bayonets and shovels, we talked about recent events. 
It is mid-July, almost a month since the war began, and we are still going deep into the country, and our withdrawal has no end in sight. The Germans are coming and going, though we are trying to hold them back on the frontiers entrusted to us, Maxim said in the heat of the moment. Everything, Mikhail, seems to be fine. Our people can fight the enemy. How can they but we have little combat equipment? After all, from the very border we have seen our airplanes only once. It seems that they keep their equipment for the time being, I replied and began to tell Sklyer how in 1938 and 1939 I saw parades on Red Square. It was when I came on a short vacation to Moscow for the holidays from the Border Guard School. My sister worked in the Moscow City Party Committee, and she managed to get me a pass to Red Square. I remembered how the People's Commissar of Defence K.E. Voroshilov rode out of the gates of the Spaskaya Tower on a horse, how the fanfare sounded, and the parade began. Infantrymen were passing by in rows, cavalrymen were dashing, machine gun wheelbarrows were rumbling, tractors were pulling artillery, light tanks were passing by, and then heavy steel hulks were rumbling onto the square. Everything was solemn and majestic. Give us time, Maxim, I finished, we'll have enough combat equipment, and the Germans will roll back, and we'll throw them off our land, as we did in the battle at the border. I wish we could see it sooner, Maxim sighed. I understand well, Mikhail, that the fascists have made the industry of almost all European countries work for themselves, and we are alone. The Nazis started suddenly, and their initial advantage is clear. I myself have seen everything that you said, and I believe the day will come, and we will force the fascists to go away. I just wish I knew when that day would finally come. It was getting evening. The village was quieting down. To Pavlenko's house, which was in the centre of the defence, began to come the heads of outposts and political officers. Soon Major Vrublevsky appeared, all entered the hut. The owner lit an oil lamp without glass and left us. Sitting down at the table, Vrublevsky unfolded the map worn on the folds and looked at it for a long time, gathering his thoughts. At night it is necessary to send a reconnaissance, he said deftly, to see what is being done around. Lieutenant Seletsky, commander of the Commandant's platoon, will go with the scouts. Combat guard to set up from each outpost. From dawn to continue defensive work. Roblevsky fell silent, closed his eyes. I still remember how tired the chief of staff looked then. Because of his black beard, his face seemed pale yellow, dark circles under his eyes. He leaned on his desk and dozed off. This went on for a few minutes. Then, coming out of his stupor, Vrublevsky said, And now to rest, comrades, and left for the command post. We continued to sit in contemplation. A weak lamp light flickered dimly, smouldering, not covered by glass. It was semi-dark in the upper room. Suddenly a heavy murmur came from the northeast. Someone looked out of the door. What is it? They are bombing fast of. Soon deafening explosions came from the south. Obviously, German heavy artillery was hitting Bila Tsurkva. We have found the headquarters of the 6th Corps, Lieutenant Titkov expressed his opinion. They didn't feel it, but the ground swelled up from the rain, so the Krauts are pressing along the roads. They can't bypass Fastov and Bila Tsurkva, Edelstein objected. Someone sighed and said suddenly, Hey, boys, now I'd like a good bowl of Poltava Galushki on the table. We had been eating badly for the last few days, and the mention of Halushki caused a stir. Then, listening to the distant rumblings, we talked again about our present affairs and the situation at the front. Everyone agreed that we were likely to face a hard test. In Popeln we were more numerous, and we had about three dozen machine guns. In addition, artillerymen, three tanks and units of the 6th NKVD regiment were fighting nearby. Now we were left no more than 300 people, our armament two machine guns and a dozen hand machine guns, no one on our right and left. That's what friends the political officer Nikolai Dolbylov stood up. What the morning will bring us we do not know. We will not give up the village easily, even if there are ten times more Germans. But let's always remember each other, and when we defeat the enemy, 
we will remember those who will not return from this war. And let's not leave our families in trouble. All supported the political officer and began to disperse. Sklaya, Anakin, Dolbilov and I settled down at Pavlenko's house. The dark sky was dotted with greenish stars. We sat under the cherry trees for a long time, listening to the muffled rumblings, and talked quietly. So we dozed off imperceptibly. With the first glimmer of dawn, everyone was on their feet. The morning of July 18th, 1941 came. It was gloomy, overcast. It was still drizzling rain. Border guards again took up shovels, continuing to equip trenches. Those who had already dug a trench were checking their weapons, loading cartridges, inspecting grenades. Vrublevsky and Avdyukin appeared. The battalion commissar was also gaunt, his clothes were dusty, but his eyes looked cheerful. With his usual mental optimism, he turned to the soldiers, cheered them up. Vrublevsky and Avdyukin bypassed the location of our commandant's office and went to the right flank. Soon heard the rumble of engines, and after a while showed German armoured vehicles. At first only their grey towers were visible from the wheat, but now the column came closer. In front were motorcyclists, followed by two tankers, and then armoured cars and vehicles with infantry. The rain washed out the road, and the column moved slowly, which made it seem that the Germans were going quite calmly, as if there could not be any obstacles in their way. The motorcyclists came closer and closer to the village. 400, 300, 200 metres. The command fire machine gunners of the 9th outpost Zlotnikov and Markolov hit almost at point-blank range from the gate of the stable. From the attic of the pigsty sergeant Sazikin shot a long line at the fascists, gave a turn and machine gunner of our outpost Ilya Goliev. As at Popolny, the front motorcyclists fell as if mowed down. The rest, abandoning motorcycles, ran away into the wheat crops, but the tankets kept crawling. Looking like squat turtles with white crosses on their sides, they headed confidently toward the village. We gazed at the shacks near the cherry plantations, where Lieutenant Fomenko and his men were huddled in the trenches. Would they or would they not apprehend these steel skulls? Here the lead car disappeared behind the house. Did they miss it? No. Explosion. Then another. White puffs of smoke billowing upward. The tankers are hit. The armoured cars slowly unfolded their guns. A dry, tinkling crackle and a snorting whistle overhead. Bang. Bang. Shells explode in the vegetable garden behind us. Someone is cursing, shouting frightened. The stomping of feet. Again explosions raise the ground, but now they are joined by the deafening clatter of machine guns. The villagers are fleeing from the village in groups and alone through the vegetable gardens. It seems that everyone who was in the huts rushed to the saving ravine. Cows roaring, geese and chickens screaming. I listen to the confusion of sounds engines are humming again. Someone shouts. Comrade Politruk, look. Look over there, some arcs are moving across the field. And indeed, on a wheat field automobiles with infantry were spreading. The Germans removed the tarpaulin, and now you can see over the sides of the metal frames. Bang. Explosions pressed us against the walls of the trenches. Bullets and shrapnel pierce the roof of Pavlenko's hut. The broken glass is ringing. The wind blows dust and thatch. Frightened screams of children are heard. Through the open door I can see how Dmitri Pavlenko's wife and children are running to the cellar. I am covered with earth. Dust. Smoke. Someone gives a command again, but I can't make it out. Shells are drilling through the air. A moment more and one of them penetrates the wall of Pavlenkov's house. Suddenly the whistling of shells and bullets is joined by the rumbling of mines. With a dry crackle they burst behind and ahead of us. What a mess we hear the voice of political officer Edelstein. For more than an hour German mortars and artillery processed our positions. In the meantime, covered with dewy wheat, the fascist machine gunners moved to the attack. We heard a friendly clash of machine guns, wheat swayed, words of commands were heard. Forverts. Forverts. Zaplatin and Fedorov froze at the machine gun. Guliaev is looking at the wheat through the slit of the sight. 
Next to him is political officer Sklaer. He says something to Galiev, pointing with his hand to where the Germans are about to appear. A few more seconds pass, and Hitlerites run out of the crops. Fire. Machine guns clattering. A few Hitlerites fall. The rest, not paying attention to our fire, continue to run forward, stitching on the move. Hit them with grenades, the bastards. Shouts the commissar of the commandant's office, Sergeant Sergei Maslov. The command rolls through the chain. Fire on the enemy with grenades. Explosions shook the ground and the air, but at our trenches mines are still bursting. We are under double fire mortars and German machine gunners. Enemy fire does not allow us to raise our heads. The situation is threatening. A little more, and Hitlerites will break into our positions. There is only one way out hand to hand. Everyone understands this. Understands and senior political officer Korovushkin. I see as he with a dozen fighters runs over the vegetable gardens. Hurrah. Lieutenant Anakin also rises, his swarthy face even more blackened, tightly compressed lips twisted, eyes burning with a feverish gleam. All of him is like a compressed spring. The bayonet of the rifle he holds in front of him gleams. I, too, put the bayonet to my rifle and stood up. Behind me the soldiers jumped up. Next to me, as always, Yedekov. Behind him, Makarov. Here is the commissar of the outpost, Vyogov. Border guards, Lyukshev, Lushnikov, Kuzmin, Kolesnikov, Dmitriev, Vinogradov, Skla, Efimov, Sergav, Ustyugov, Savchenko, Saichev, Arbazov, and a few more fighters rushed at the Germans. And behind them rose border guards Agafonov, Schleichtin, Smenov, Vankov, Kudryashov, Zikin, led by their commander, Sergeant Mikhailov. Arah! This cry weaves together our impulse. The fascists do not accept hand-to-hand -hand combat run to the parking lots. Mines are now bursting somewhere behind us. But then the Nazis transfer the fire. In front of us grows a barrier fire shaft. We are forced to withdraw to our trenches. The shelling starts again. And again the Nazis attacked us. And again, in order to get out from under the double shelling and to disrupt the enemy attack, we went into hand-to-hand -hand combat. Fascists and this time retreated, having stopped us by desperate mortar fire. Ivan Bespalov, a border guard of our commandant's office, recalls about this battle in the village of Elisivovtovka the defence was good. Several times the Germans after artillery and mortar preparation went on the attack. They went drunk, in full height, climbed all the way. We let them at a close distance and fought them off as best we could. To repel the attacks, however, was hindered by the fact that the fascists, even at this time, did not stop mortar fire. And then, to repel the enemy, we went hand to hand. But the Germans were fleeing before we caught up with them. So Hitlerites could not master the village, but they did not leave us alone. Another shelling was so exhausting that it seemed that we could not bear it. Shrapnel sliced the air with a shrill screech. Bullets sliced sunflowers stripped the bark off cherry branches. Dust and smoke covered everything around. When there was a pause in the shelling and I looked out of my foxhole, what appeared before my eyes struck me. The trees near us were completely white, as if they had been suddenly trimmed by the dexterous hand of a woodcutter. Pavlenko's yard was riddled with craters. Hundreds of holes riddled the walls of the house. Nestled around the corner, Pavel Boyko bandaged the bloody man, but did not finish he said deceased it was my friend and neighbour on the outpost Lieutenant Anakin. Next to him lay someone else's lifeless body Politruk Dolbilov. Lieutenant Ponomarenko, head of communications of the Commandant's office, had been killed. At the well, where just stood our hand-held machine gun, lay flattened box with magazines and shapeless metal. Machine gunner Goliev and political officer Sklaer lay motionless. I got out of the trench and ran up to Maxim. His grey coat was darkened with blood. His face was pale, his eyes half open. Border guards Vyugov and Lyuchev appeared from somewhere. They lifted the lifeless body of the Politruk and carried it to the house. Guliaev was also put here. Almost automatically, I took out of the pocket of Sklar's Gymnospear party ticket, identity card, a photo of Albertina and handed it all to Vyugov. Having finished bandaging the wounded, Pavel Boyko came to us. He examined Sklyer and Gulyav. They no longer need my help. 
Shocked, I stood in a kind of daze, seeing nothing around me but the fallen of my close combat friends. It seemed like a terrible dream just open your eyes and everything would disappear. But it was reality. Meanwhile, the enemy began to attack on the site of the 4th Commandant's office. There created a critical situation. The enemy pressed on the chain of border guards more and more strongly. The soldiers barely repulsed the onslaught of the drunken fascist horde. Chief of Staff of the 4th Commandant's Office Senior Lieutenant Andriakov decided to counterattack the enemy. Helping our neighbours went into counterattack and outposts of our Commandant's Office. So we went into hand-to-hand -hand combat for the third time. And the enemy fled again. The day was gradually fading. Blue gloom descended on the ground. Little by little, everything began to quiet down. Having failed to break our resistance, the Nazis gave up further offensive. However, they remained in the field at their original lines. Fascists reminded about themselves rockets, which now and then launched from the parking lots of their vehicles. Scattering into many small sparks, the rockets illuminated the trampled wheat field with greenish ghostly light. Somewhere near Fastov and Bielatserkva, yellow-black light sheaves were also pushing apart the dark sky, and heavy sighs of explosions were heard. We looked warily into the suddenly lowered fog somewhere there were Germans lurking. Deep in the night, Captain Andrianov arrived in Elisevatovka from Belaya Tsurkva, from the headquarters of the 6th Rifle Corps. He informed the head of the detachment that the corp units had left the town. Someone from the command ordered to bury the dead border guards. Right in the vegetable garden of collective farmer Dmitry Pavlenko a mass grave was dug. A liaison arrived from the detachment headquarters. He conveyed that the order to move to the railroad between Fastov and Bila Tsurkva was received. Lieutenant Tikumirov, political officer Edelstein, and I built the border guards of the Commandant's office. The soldiers put the mortally wounded junior Lieutenant Danilov on a trench coat, and we set off. The road led to a ravine where the command post of the detachment was located. Not far from the brick house there were squad cars stuck in the mud. Recollecting the battle in Elisevatovka, the son of Dmitry Efimovich Pavlenko Vladimir wrote many years later, although I was a boy then, but I remember when the border guards came to us in Elisevatovka. Soldiers in green caps fought heroically with fascists. You stood to the death for our village. Thanks to your courage, the fascist bastards were afraid to enter Elisevatovka, even when the enemy was already near Kiev, before entering. The village, Hitlerites sent a motorized reconnaissance. That's what you scared them then. The villagers will never forget this battle, and those who died a brave death. Yes, the feat, which was made by the border guards of the detachment in July 1941 on the distant approaches to Kiev, the capital of Ukraine, is not forgotten. At the request of the workers of Fastovsky district, by the decision of the Kiev Regional Council of Workers' Deputies on May 30th, 1965 on the square in the village of Elisevatovka, in the centre of our defence, installed a granite obelisk, on which in golden letters is written, It's eternal glory to the heroes. On July 17th to 18th, 1941, in the area of Elisevatovka village border guards of the 94th Detachment fought heroic battles against Hitler's invaders. The death of the brave fell Anakin P.T., Danilov V., a. Dolbailov N. G. G. Efimov Chukov Kolmikov I. D. Osaji Savchenkov M. A. Sklaya M. A. Titov P. M. Titkov A. V. Tsevetkov. Built in memory of the feet of Soviet border guards. On the granite slab carved twelve names. There are no names of Ilya Mikhailovich Goliav, Leonid Petrovich Gorozhaninov, Anatoly Ivanovich Zaplatin, Leonid Kirillovich Ponomarenko, and many others who also fell in that battle. The granite obelisk reminds that in a hard time for our motherland, a small group of border guards stood here to the death and did not let the enemy pass. This obelisk is a testimony of courage and fearlessness of fighters in green caps, their selfless devotion to their fatherland. At dawn on July 19th we arrived at a small railway station Ustinovka. The morning was gloomy, foggy and rainy. Drenched, hungry, exhausted by the sleepless night march, the border guards sat right on the stone platform of the station and fell asleep. It seemed that no force could make them get up. 
The command and headquarters staff gathered in the station building. Captain Rebristi, the head of communications of the detachment, tried to reach the headquarters of the border district through the railroad telephone network, but he was not answered. However, he did not lose hope and kept calling Kiev. Eventually it was possible to connect with the chief of staff of the district troops, Colonel Rogatin. But the conversation was interrupted German telephonists cut into the network. No specific instructions from Rogatin could not be obtained. A light breeze gradually dispersed the morning fog. Rare houses of the station village became visible. In the northeast, about two kilometres from the station, the edge of a small forest peeped through the haze. The first roosters crowed, and after the roosters crowing, the silence of the morning was broken by the heavy rumble of engines mixed with the crackle of motorcycles. The rumble was getting closer the Germans were moving towards the station. Politruk Edelstein, Junior Lieutenant Tikhomirov and I, having roused the squad commanders, began to wake up the border guards together with them. At the outpost, the soldiers jumped up at the lightest touch. It was almost impossible to lift the sleeping men from the cold cement platform. Branch commanders put almost every man on his feet and shook him until he came to his senses. So one by one, all of them were woken up. Without fuss and noise, the border guards lined up, waiting to see what they would be ordered to do next. It was seen how in the distance along the railroad bed from Fastov, grinding against the rails with tracks, German tanks crawled to Ustinovka and motorcyclists came to the crossing, hidden from us by plantings. We had nothing to fight with Hitlerites the machine gun without ribbons. The manual machine gunners had incomplete magazines. The soldiers had one or two magazines all that was left after the battle in Elisavitovka. Apparently the command realised that the most reasonable thing was to save the men. Someone from the headquarters staff ran out of the station building and, pointing towards the forest with his hand, commanded. Run, march. Having run across the railroad bed, we rushed towards the forest. It was a small forest, one might even say a forest viewed from end to end, but still it was a shelter. A ditch bordered the forest, and along it grew oak trees mixed with bushes. Along these bushes the outposts took a circular defence. The headquarters of the detachment was located in the centre. After yesterday's battle, the night march, and everything we had experienced, the forest seemed to us a safe haven. No Germans could not be seen, though from the side of Ustinovka we could hear their voices. Apparently some German part was moving there, which we almost collided with at night, leaving Elisavetovka. Then the noise of a moving column came from the opposite direction. We found ourselves at the crossroads on which the fascist troops were moving. From time to time the Germans shot at the forest, but apparently they were random shots, and we felt relatively safe. We were more and more occupied with thoughts, not about the possibility of a new skirmish with the enemy, but about how to satisfy our hunger. It was now six days since we had tasted no hot food. For the last three days we had been eating God knows what. The border guards were lying or sitting in some half-asleep stupor. Toward evening, the physically stronger soldiers and commanders began to say that it would be possible to risk going to Ustinovka, not far from the station, and try to get food there. In the end, the command was inclined to do so. When it became completely dark, a group of volunteers, which included soldiers from all outposts, under the command of Major Vrublevsky, went to the village. With the help of the locals, they got some food. On the way back, our walkers encountered German sentries. A firefight ensued. It ended, however, safely. Without losing a single person, the group returned to the forest. Having satisfied their hunger, people became cheerful. Voices began to be heard. Someone cautiously warns. Quiet, boys. They laugh at him. What are we thieves? We're on our own land. Let the fascists hide. I recognise Sergei Maslov, the secretary of the Komsomol Bureau of the Commandant's office. You're very brave, Serioga. Someone else joined the conversation. They have tanks, and we have nothing but rifles and machine guns. But Maslov really got excited. I don't understand how long are we going to stay here? A branch crunched. Someone's calm voice said. And there's nothing to understand. You see what's going on around here. 
To kill people in vain it does not take intelligence, but to save them, to get out of the encirclement it is quite a different matter. We still have to repay Hitlerites for everything, we must defeat them. This was said by Battalion Commissar Nikolai Akimovich Avdukin. He always spoke like that softly, without raising his voice, simply convincing the interlocutor not by intonation, not by authority of the senior, but by logic arguments. Our commissar did not look very brave. Small in stature, with light bald spots, soft swaying gait, he looked more like a civilian, although he had served in the army for over twenty years. But he was loved and respected. Oh, and above all for the fact that he always knew when and what to say to people, was able to support them in time, to help them. He was at ease in conversation, talk, accessible, and this further strengthened his authority, caused confidence in him. Having finished talking to Maslov, Avdukin went further. Apparently the battalion commissar wanted to go around the location of outposts, talk to people, cheer them up. The engines were murmuring fainter and fainter, the sounds around them were quieting down. The night was coming into its own, but the command of the detachment did not sleep they had to decide how to proceed, where to leave the encirclement. There was no unified opinion. Some suggested to go through Grebenki to Vasilkov and further to Kiev, others advised to sneak through Pinchuki to Abukov and Tripolia. Finally it was decided to create reconnaissance groups to clarify the situation and choose the route. One of them, which included the assistant commissar of the detachment on Komsomol work Peter Latyshev and several border guards, was headed by Major Vrublevsky. The senior of the other was appointed assistant chief of the department of the detachment headquarters, Captain A. I. Alexo. I. Alexo. With him went several commanders. Reconnaissance teams found fords through the swamp, lying not far from the Ustinovsky forest, and outlined the further route out of the encirclement. In the morning from Ustinovka came a rooster's cry. Cows rumbled, dogs barked. The sun rose imperceptibly. Its rays penetrated the crown of trees and light glare lay on the meadows. High in the sky we heard a ringing rumble of airplanes. It grew stronger and stronger, and now wedges of enemy bombers hung over us. The roads came alive, clanked, roared. Everything around rattled and rumbled enemy columns were coming in an endless stream. Flies were buzzing in the forest, some bugs were crawling lively on the grass. The ants worked diligently, unaware of anything. The day seemed incredibly long. At last the sun reluctantly hid its red disk behind the horizon. Evening gloom enveloped the fields. On the morning again came to life roads, packed with tanks, artillery and motorised infantry of the enemy. But now there was a small gap between the columns, and we heard an unusual squeak a cart was approaching the forest. The horse was driven by a short man dressed in a dark shirt. A boy of about fourteen sat beside him on the cart. The wagon turned off the road into a field. The man took off his scythe, looked around, then shouldered the sack and lowered it to the ground the boy, ran up to the edge of the field and nodded his head in the direction of the sack. Soon we had the sack of groceries. We realised that we could rely on these people. Someone from the staff talked to the peasant and asked him to take the wounded when we left. We left the Ustinovsky forest on the third or fourth day. Under the cover of darkness a column of 250 border guards started moving behind enemy lines. We walked in pitch darkness to the east, sticking to the landmarks given by the scouts. Three or four hours later, somewhere between Gribenki and Pinchuki, a swamp blocked our way. Junior Lieutenant Ilya Vasilchenko was waiting by the shore. Major Bozy, head of the squad, asked him if there was a ford through the swamp. Yes, answered Vasilchenko, but immediately added where exactly I do not know. Captain Alexo and Senior Lieutenant Kuklenko crossed the swamp, and the place of crossing was not marked. In the daytime, maybe, I would have found it, but in such darkness. Soon after the anger of the squad leader had subsided, we were ordered to tie two sheaves of wheat to lean on when crossing the swamp. While we were pulling the stiff stalks and knitting them, a bright streak of dawn broke on the horizon. An anxious, sultry feeling was experienced then by each of us. Not so much because nobody knew how the opposite shore would meet us, but because we would have to knead this stinking slurry. Having prepared the sheaves, the border guards were slow to enter the swamp. Then the battalion Commissar Avdukin came to the shore and with his usual humour said, 
Well, eagles. Shall we go over this puddle? Avdukin was the first to step into the shaky coastal soil overgrown with sedge. Captain Miziashvili and Sergeant Mendrin followed him. They walked only a few steps and got bogged down in the mire. Then, leaning on sheaves, they moved forward a little more with difficulty. Everyone realised that it was going to be very tight. I was a good swimmer. Border guard Makarov, an Astrakhan fisherman, was also an excellent swimmer at the outpost. But there were two men on the outpost who couldn't swim at all. They were dragged into the swamp with great difficulty. When there was more water, the border guards gathered waist belts and tied several sheaves together. Those who could not swim took hold of these peculiar rafts, and the border guards took turns pulling them. The farther we went into the swamp, the less and less solid ground there was under our feet. Then our feet stopped touching the ground altogether. Those were hard minutes. The soldiers strained all their strength to overcome the deep water. People almost crawled, overcoming the last metres in the swampy slurry. Once on the shore, they fell down, exhausted, and after a little rest, pulled off their black, covered with sticky mud gymnasts, poured water out of their boots. The underwear was sticking to the body, increasing the chill. To keep warm, the soldiers huddled together. At these moments, no one thought about the danger. But it was close. Nearby was the highway from Bila Tsirkva to Kiev. It was risky to delay here. But our commanders did not dare to cross the road at once. They sent forward some fighters with Lieutenant Fomenko. Not far from the highway, the border guards came upon a German field guard. They took off one sentry, but the other, having found out the scouts, raised shooting. Hitlerites on the road stirred. Rockets flew into the sky. A machine gun struck. Machine guns rattled. Unexpected firing took us out of stupor. It became clear we had to fight our way through. But so far the fascists did not see us. Border guards of the 4th Commandant's office headed by Captain Andrianov suddenly rushed northward along the bank of the swamp. I, too, raised the outpost. Behind us, not lagging behind, followed the rest of the border guards of the Commandant's office. Having swung across the highway to the right of the place from where the shooting was heard, we found ourselves near some village. As if from under the ground a tall, thin figure of one of the staff of the detachment, Captain Maziashvili, appeared in front of us. He was holding a carbine. Stop. Why panic? We stopped. Chow? Line up, ordered the captain. While the border guards were lining up, the Germans discovered us. At the same time, they opened fire from Grebenki and Pinchuki villages. But we were covered by a thick fog. Thanks to it, we managed to leave the firing zone unnoticed. Hitlerites started a firefight among themselves and we, taking advantage of it, safely overcame a small rivulet which appeared on our way and got to the saving shrubbery. The sun came up. Houses appeared ahead. Just in case Captain Mizyashvili turned us in a chain. But there were no Germans in the village. But the inhabitants seemed to be waiting for us. Adults and children all came out into the street. They handed us bread, lard, boiled potatoes. However, we could not linger. On the right and on the left we could already hear the crackle of German motorcycles. Hitlerites, having realised that some Soviet unit had slipped under their noses, decided to catch up with it. At the embankment of the railroad, which was several kilometres away from the village, the mobile group of fascists met us with machine gun and machine gun fire. Captain Maziashvili ordered the heads of outposts, Lieutenants Rabovsky and Trushevsky to crush the enemy barrier. Together with border guards of their outposts, Rabovsky and Trushevsky destroyed the enemy. But in a short fight, Lieutenant Semyon Rabovsky and several other border guards were killed. Barely we passed over the embankment of the narrow gauge railway as the enemy's machine guns and machine guns struck again. This time Hitlerites were in a small wood. We destroyed this barrier too but left on the battlefield the deputy commandant junior political officer Nikolai Nestrov and many others. An enemy bullet also killed our paramedic Pavel Boyko. Now outposts moved independently. In small groups it was easier to get through the enemy outposts. On wheat crops, along ravines, avoiding roads, the border guards of the 10th outpost were sneaking until on a small hill between the villages of Grigorovka 
and Machishevka, they met several workers of the headquarters of the detachment Bulanov, Korolkov, Ribristi, Yakoviva. Major Bozy was with them. Border guards from other outposts were also coming up here. The sun was shining brightly. Steam was coming from our uniforms, which had not dried overnight after forcing the swamp. A column of fighters appeared from behind a hill. They were border guards, who still in Skvira left to the disposal of the deputy commissar of the NKGB of the Ukrainian SSR, Major Tkachenko. In front of the column was Major Ivanov, the chief of staff of the rear guard of the 26th Army. I was struck by the exceptional discipline of the formation and excellent alignment of the soldiers. Ivanov on the move talked to the head of the detachment, Major Bossy. From the phrases he heard it became clear that Major Ivanov and his men were going to Mironovka to cover the Kaniv crossing of the Dnieper. Many years later from the village of Ustinovka I received a letter from Ivan Arkhipovich Kirichenko, that charioteer who delivered food to us in the forest with his son, and whom we asked to take the wounded after our withdrawal. Here is what I. A. Kirichenko wrote that day, when I brought a bag of food to the border guards, I was asked to take two soldiers who were very weak from wounds. In the morning my son and I drove into the forest on a cart. The wounded were in the agreed place. We put them on the cart, uh, covered them with cut grass and brought them home. In total in our village there were about a dozen wounded border guards. We took them all home and hid them. One of those who remained in the village at that time was found. He turned out to be border guard Vyacheslav Ravsky. I was very weak after a contusion on July 19th in the village of Elisafetovka, he said. When I came to myself, I saw the commandant's military officer Mikhail Danilovich Galushko. He gave me an injection and I lost consciousness again. I woke up in some house. As I found out later, it was the house of I.A. Kirichenko, a resident of Ustinovka village. Later I fought in the units of the Second Belarusian Front until the day of our victory. In December 1946 I was demobilized. About the fate of another wounded border guard, the commander of the squad Sergeant Andrei Venigdiktova, told in Ustinovka, when I visited there after the war. Severely wounded Venigdiktov was sheltered from a German raid by the locals. He was treated for a long time, and when the Red Army liberated the village he went to the front. He commanded a platoon, died in battle during the liberation of Budapest. Who else was with Raevsky and Venigdiktov? What became of them it is unknown. So, between the villages of Grigorovka and Machashevka, we finally broke away from the pursuit and, as it turned out, broke out of the encirclement. Having put themselves in order, the border guards organised themselves into a marching column. Major Bozy ordered to report on the number of men, and we moved along the bank of a small river to the east. Neither I nor the other chiefs of outposts had maps, so we did not know where this river led. And it led to the Dnieper, to the village of Tripolia, famous for its tragedy during the Civil War, which was 50 kilometres south of Kiev. We arrived there in the evening. We were pointed out where we should take a temporary defence. The detachment command again tried to contact the local telephone line with the headquarters of the border district. Our outpost was ordered to take up positions on the outskirts of Tripolia by the road. Having set up observers, we settled down at a garden house on the outskirts. The evening was quiet and warm. We could hear the monotonous, lulling noise of the Dnieper. After a hearty dinner fed to us by the locals, the border guards came, as they say, to their senses. The most vigorous Makarov and Kretinin began to ask where we would go next over the Dnieper or to Kiev. To avoid the conversation, I said vaguely that the top knows better, and our business is to wait for new orders. At the same time I realised that my subordinates should be cheered up somehow, and then I remembered an article I had once read, The Tripoli Tragedy. The article told how in June 1919 in the village where we were now, heroically fought with the gang of Ataman Zelenyogo party and Komsomol detachment. The bandits managed to surround a handful of communists and Komsomol members, but they did not surrender. Repeatedly throwing themselves into bayonet attack, they fought to the last bullet. The bandits brutally tortured those captured. I told the border guards about what happened in Tripolia more than 20 years ago. Long ago, but bright feet touched people's souls. The soldiers began to discuss what they had heard. 
and a native of these places, Sergeant Smolianet's remark. And after all, in 1938 in Tripolia, there is an obelisk to the heroes. Let us, Comrade Chief, take a look at it. The proposal was accepted with enthusiasm. The border guards unanimously decided to find the obelisk. Perhaps, despite the night, we would have done it. But then a contact from the detachment headquarters appeared and told us that the outpost should urgently arrive on the bank of the Dnieper. When we ran up to the slope, we saw a small steamer at the quay on which the border guards were loading. Soon we were on the deck. Almost silently, the steamer moved away from the shore and slid downstream. The night was dark and starry. The muffled rhythmic noise of the steam engine could be heard in the semi-darkness. Someone asked softly, Where are they taking us? He was answered. To the other side. No, boys, Makarov intervened. We are going along the fairway heading to the southeast. That's right, we're going along the shore. Several voices supported Makarov at once. The beautiful river quickly carried its murky waters. Even in the darkness, the right bank stood out with its steep cliffs. The sandbanks of the left bank almost merged with the water. Only dense thickets of vines were visible there. The wind shook the tops of the trees, and they ran into the water in black waves, which made it seem that the shore was always moving toward us. The steamer rocked slightly. The rocking was lulling. How long we sailed, I do not know. I woke up to a heavy stomping. It was getting light. The steamer was standing near the shore. Border guards, who had slept on the deck, ran down the gangway. Soon we got off too. Having lined up, we went up the hill, passed the field, and found ourselves in the yard of some factory. Border guards of the rear units of the detachment and manoeuvring group had already settled here. A little later the soldiers of the 4th Commandant's office appeared together with Captain Andrianov. The detachment was concentrating in the town of Kanev. From the factory yard was visible railroad bridge across the Dnieper. Downstream the army sappers were building a pontoon bridge on the Dnieper crossings. The city of Kanev nestled on the right bank of the Dnieper. Outwardly it looked like a big rich village with many stone buildings. A little away from the city, on a steep hill, rested the tomb of the great son of the Ukrainian people Taras Shevchenko. Shevchenko's monument was clearly visible for many versts around. On the other side of the city was the railroad. The railroad bridge connected both banks of the river. When we arrived here, this corner of Ukraine looked as if there was no war. In the factory yard people in green caps, clean, neat, as if they had just come off the posters, were leisurely walking around. These were border guards of the manoeuvre group and cavalry squadron who had been in reserve all this time and had never been in combat. Some of them received orders, formed up and went somewhere. Others headed for the camp kitchens and started breakfast. Dirty, overgrown, tired, we looked like aliens from another planet. While we were scrubbing off the dirt and washing up, our housekeeper, the deputy commandant for supplies, senior Lieutenant Ire Regeda, a black-haired, swarthy-faced Ukrainian about 35 years old, showed up. We had not seen him for ten days. Regeda welcomed us cordially and, pointing to the edge of the kitchen, said cheerfully, Well, boys, come and eat to your heart's content. And he began to explain why all these days he could not find us he was late in getting to Popelna, and then he lost sight of the commandant's office. While telling how he was trying to find us, Regeda looked at one and another border guard, as if he was looking for someone. Where are senior political officer Korovushkin, Captain Gladkick? And there are not enough people, he hesitantly said. Not all of them came up. Korovushkin and Gladkick were wounded and sent to the rear, Tikhomirov replied glumly. We may meet them yet, but the others. As if not believing, Regeda cautiously asked. And Boyko? And Sklaya? And Nestorov? Yes, Tikhomirov remarked, growing even more gloomy, and Boyko and Sklaya and Nestorov. Having received breakfast, the soldiers went aside, discussing their current situation, sharing their experiences. Soon the rear units of the detachment left Kanov and crossed the pontoon bridge to the left bank of the Dnieper to the Laplava forest, and the chiefs of the arrived outposts were summoned to the headquarters of the detachment. 
There we were told that the units and formations of the 26th Army repulsed fierce attacks of the enemy, trying to break through to the Dnieper crossings in the areas of Rysheshov and Kanev. There are no troops in Kanev, except for the border guard detachment. Only a small NKVD unit guarding the railroad bridge. We were ordered to take the defence at Kanev. The city was covered by a manoeuvring group together with the second commandant's office, the bridge a unit of internal troops under the command of Petty Officer Shabakov and a reserve outpost headed by the secretary of the Komsomol Bureau, Petty Officer Maslov. The third and fourth commandant's offices, which suffered the greatest losses in the fighting, should move to the left bank of the Dnieper. For the first time during the withdrawal, we were waiting for a pre-prepared defence. Full-profile trenches were dug in the sandy soil right by the bank, reinforced with willow rods. There were also covers on top canopies woven from poles. The trenches for machine guns looked even more solid and resembled bunkers. Log rollers reliably protected people from bullets and splinters. Right by the railroad bridge, the border guards of the 9th outpost, headed by political officer Edelstein, took up trenches. Closer to the pontoon bridge were our 10th and 11th outposts. Further defences were occupied by junior Lieutenant Tikomirov with his men. In the area of the pontoon bridge, settled border guards of the 4th Commandant's office under the command of the Deputy Commandant for political part, Senior Political Officer Yakov Potapenko. Captain Andrianov left again, this time to the reconnaissance department of the 38th Army. The left flank along the riverbank was covered by the cavalry squadron of Senior Lieutenant Evstafiev. We were assigned the task to protect and defend the bridges and to ensure order during the movement of the Red Army units across them. In the morning of the next day, three armoured boats of the Pinsk military flotilla approached Kanov. They became at small islands near the railroad bridge in the bend of the Dnieper. An armoured train arrived at the station. Another armoured train was in the rear, in the Laplava forest. After a while, a platoon of large calibre anti-aircraft machine guns was positioned in the junction between our and the 9th outposts. From the air, the crossing was covered by a platoon of fighter planes. Nowhere were we supported by so many firepower as here. Never before had our trenches, trenches and communication lines been so carefully equipped. In front of us lay a wide water frontier. And ahead beyond Kanov were still our units. True. The enemy aviation continuously bombed the supply stations of the 26th Army Le Plavo and Zolotonosha, but the fascists did not touch us and the bridges. Apparently they expected to use the crossings in the future. A week passed. The soldiers had time to get used to their new life. They learned to sleep and eat in the trenches, to spend their leisure time in them. We began to eat quite well. Every day Senior Lieutenant Rajeda brought us hot food in thermoses. By the end of the week we even got a newspaper. True, it was not a central, but only an army newspaper, but we read it with great interest. A small sheet of newspaper passed from hand to hand, from trench to trench. It was worn to a crisp. I remember that evening. The sun had long ago fallen below the horizon. Only at the very edge of the sky were scarlet clouds. A breeze flew over the Dnieper, whirled the water. Then it ran to the shore, rumbled in the bushes, raised dry sandy dust, drove it to the water. It was repeated several times. At last the wind died down. Night came. I was turning from side to side on the sand that had warmed up during the day and remembered only what I had read in the newspaper during the day on a number of sections of the western direction the enemy, using a large number of motorised troops and aviation, not considering the huge losses, is trying to develop an offensive against our troops. German attacks are encountering stubborn resistance of the Red Army units. In the southwestern direction, the Germans continue to introduce new forces into the battle. Opposing the enemy, the Red units hold back the enemy's offensive and cause him significant damage. Not overcome by insomnia, I decided to check the service of our guard. In the rifle squads, everything was in order, the sentries reported clearly, but at the machine gunners of Sergeant Smolians, everyone was asleep. I woke up Smolians and gave him the necessary indoctrination. Then, having got out of the trench, I went to the pontoon bridge. Thus, going from one trench to another, I met the morning of July 30th. The sky was turning pink. There was absolute silence. The water in the Dnieper seemed to have stopped. 
In the grey haze of dawn I saw Sergeant Mikhailov sitting on the barrier. I sat down next to him, and we began to admire the morning river, the splashes of awakened fish. Unnoticeably, a muffled rumbling hum floated over the water. We could not understand what it was. Then the noise of engines of our three hawks, which emerged from behind the Laplava forest, broke into this hum. An armoured train, standing on the other side of the bridge, rumbled its turrets, pointing its guns at the road approaching the town. Guns and armoured boats were deployed there as well. Sergeant Mikhailov, myself and border guard Makarov, who came up to us, looked into the distance, but saw nothing but swirling columns of dust over the road. Then we went to the railroad bridge and climbed on it. The fascist troops were moving towards Kanev in a long column tanks, armoured personnel carriers, cars with infantry. Hitlerites apparently did not expect to meet serious resistance here. As soon as the head of the column approached our defence, the air was shaken by strong explosions. With all power of their guns, armoured trains and boats of Pinsk flotilla fell on the enemy, and from La Plava forest heavy artillery hit the enemy through our heads. The road was covered with cinders. The wheat was in flames, there was a desperate crackling and rumbling all around. Hitlerites threw burning cars and tanks, and the guns of the armoured train continued to send shell after shell by direct fire. Machine gun crackle crashed into the gun rumble. This machine gunner's manoeuvring group shot enemy infantry. It went on for about an hour. Unable to withstand, the enemy began to hastily withdraw. Even now, years later, I can hear the excited voice of Sergeant Mikhailov overlapping the rumble of the artillery cannonade. Look, Makarov, look, all of you, how the fascists know how to dodge when an equal force gets in their way. We looked at the road covered with flames and thought if we had such artillery support, so much ammunition, if not only at Kanov, but at every frontier there was such a fire barrier on the way of fascists, Hitlerites would never have managed to occupy the territory they had captured at the beginning of the war. On that last day of July at Kanev bridges over the Dnieper, we clearly realised that we could beat the fascists. The powerful fire with which the defenders of Kanev met the fascist invaders, the failure in the attempt to seize the city and the crossings on the move, apparently alarmed Hitler's command. All the next day over our defences hovered enemy scout planes, trying to spot artillery positions. However, armoured trains these nomadic batteries and armoured boats so skillfully manoeuvred and camouflaged that the Germans failed to detect them. In the first days of fighting for the Dnieper crossings they were invulnerable to the enemy. On the morning of August 2nd, with German pedantry, whole schools of Heinkels and Junkers flew through our defences. Having made a U-turn, they rained down on La Plava Station and La Plava Forest. The bombers dive bombed with howling and screeching. Sand tornadoes rose above the station. Fragments of pine trees were flying. The incessant explosions splintered and broke the forest. The station buildings caught fire. It was our turn. Enemy planes, having gained altitude, began to dive on our trenches. It was seen how the bombs came off the planes. With a wild, heartbreaking screech, they rushed to the ground. The walls of the trenches shook from the explosions and sand floated in them like water in a flood. One of the bombs fell where Sergeant Smullyan's machine gunners were. A strong explosion drowned out everything around them. New explosions. Blunt shot of large calibre machine gun. The fire of the batteries of the armoured train. All this merged into a single rumble. Finally the planes flew away. I ran to the machine gunners. The bomb turned out a crater five metres in diameter, but it didn't hit the trench. I asked if everyone was alive. All, comrade chief, reported Alexei Khetinin, alive and well. And on the outskirts of the city a real battle was unfolding. Dive bombers threw bombs, then wing to wing on a glide pass over our units, hit from guns and machine guns. From the road and directly from the field was coming steel avalanche tanks, and armoured personnel carriers inexorably approached, spewing from the mouths of guns deadly fire. It seemed that nothing could not stop this armoured armada. But again armoured trains entered the battle. Then sharp, ringing volleys hit the tanks camouflaged near the island's armoured boats. The devastating fire forced the Nazi tanks to hide in a ravine. Then heavy shells of long-range artillery flew from the Plava forest. 
tanks began to hastily withdraw. The Germans did not attack for the next three or four days, but all this time continued artillery duel of German and our batteries. By the end of the fourth day, the enemy established that there were no our troops to the right of the station on the western bank of the Dnieper. Then Hitler's battalion, supported by a dozen of tanks, bypassed Karnev station, got out to the river and developed an attack along the bank, intending to cut off our pre-bridge defence. The fire of armoured trains and boats, however, forced the enemy to stop and entrench about two kilometres from the bridge. The next day the Nazis again tried to advance, but again failed. I write only about the men of my squad and what was on the site where we fought. I realise that this is an incomplete coverage of the events that took place in those days on the Dnieper, on the southwest direction. But such private combat episodes formed the picture of the first heroic battles. There, far away from us, there were no less heated battles. The Red Army units were crossing the railroad and pontoon bridges, carrying ammunition and military equipment. In the first half of August, the Soviet troops fighting near Kiev everywhere firmly restrained the superior enemy forces. By the middle of August, the Red Army units began to concentrate in La Plava Forest, where the headquarters of the 26th Army was located. I remember, one night the planks were piled on the railroad bridge, and in the morning a tank brigade 50 to 60 medium and heavy tanks passed over them, over the pontoon bridge, crossed to the other side of the cavalry unit. Apparently the cavalrymen had not yet been in battle. They rode past our trenches, teasing us. Hey, border guards, why did you miss the border and now you are stuck on the Dnieper? They had fat horses, carbines behind their backs, pikes in their hands, small flags on their pikes. Almost everyone had a bright red ribbon over his shoulder, on which were visible the words that corresponded to the fighting spirit of cavalryman Don Berlin. The tank brigade and cavalrymen successfully repulsed the German battalion from the bridge and drove it 20 kilometres, up to Mironovka. But the offensive was halted by German aviation, which bombed the tanks and cavalry. We were also hit. The raid lasted several hours. Hitler's pilots still did not touch only the railroad bridge. However, one bomb still hit it. Our armoured train lost manoeuvrability. By the end of the next day, the remnants of the cavalry withdrew by the pontoon bridge. They said that the surviving tanks broke through to Kiev. Border guards of the detachment also crossed from the other bank. The armoured train entered the bridge and together with the bridge was blown up. The Germans occupied Kanev. It happened on August 18th. Now only the waters of the Dnieper separated us from the enemy. From the dominating bank Hitlerites easily viewed the line of our trenches. Pedantically, exactly at six in the morning, they started artillery and mortar shelling. In the middle of the day, the AV aviation appeared. After dropping bombs, the German pilots descended to shaving flight and shelled us from machine guns. We shot back with rifles. A platoon of large caliber machine guns drove away the fascist vultures. Then again, shells and mines began to burst on our shore. Fortunately, there were almost no direct hits. Soon, all units of the detachment left in the direction of Helmiazov. Only outposts of the 3rd Commandant's office and a unit of internal troops of NKVD with Petty Officer Shabakov remained at Kanov. These days were especially memorable. The only representative of the command was Senior Lieutenant Rajeda. With Petty Officer Ivan Turnov, he usually left for the whole day to the army supply station in the area of Leplava Forest and appeared again with the onset of darkness. But one day Rajeda was hit by an enemy air raid. The car, which was used to deliver food, was destroyed and he was wounded. So we found ourselves without a senior chief, and now we had to get food on our own. However, a way out was found. After bombing and shelling, there was a lot of stunned fish floating in the Dnieper, and the soldiers collected it and cooked it in the kitchen of the unit of internal troops. On August 23rd, finally we got a replacement. Junior Lieutenant Tikomirov, Political Officer Edelstein, Petty Officer Maslov and I transferred our defence plots to the army company. The soldiers of the company were dressed in new uniforms, just issued from the warehouses. Each of them had a strap, a duffel bag, a kettle, a flask and a pouch. The company arrived early in the morning. Having gathered at the command post at Tikomirov near the railroad embankment, we, having consulted, 
decided that Petty Officer Maslov and Petty Officer Shebakov with their men would be the first to withdraw, after them Political Officer Edelstein and Tikhomirov's outpost. The last to leave the shore will be the border guards of our outpost. At first everything went well. The outposts that left first safely reached the edge of the Leplava forest. We also walked through the bushes for a kilometre and a half. But now there were open sand mounds, and the Germans discovered our advance. Immediately there was shooting. Heavy high explosive shells, rumbling, flew over our heads and tore ahead of us. One hit right in the chain, falling between me and the border guards Dmitriev and Edekov. I gave the command run, forward but the shell continued to creep along the sand after us by inertia. A few moments passed, we were already behind a small sandy hillock, overgrown with bushes, and there was no explosion the German shell did not explode. We spent the rest of the day and night in the forest. Here we were found by the squad's household staff and washed in the camp bathhouse. For the first time since the day of departure from the border we changed our underwear. It became known that our detachment was being reorganised into the 94th Border Regiment. Major Vroblevsky was appointed its commander, Battalion Commissar Avdyukin was appointed the military commissar of the regiment, Major Dinigo was appointed the chief of staff. The head of the detachment Major Bosogo was recalled to the headquarters of the rear guard of the 26th Army. From our third commandant's office created a company, the commander of which was appointed Captain Rikov, and his deputy for political part senior political officer Mayorov. Platoon commanders were junior Lieutenant Simonov from the manoeuvring group, the commander of the economic platoon Lieutenant Belotsakovsky and me. Our company arrived at the place Drabov, which was about 70 kilometres from the Kanev crossings. There I was handed the mandate No, 61 of August 25th, 1941. The bearer of this. It said, Lieutenant Padjev Mikhail Grigorievich of the 94th Frontier Regiment of the NK8D, for the protection of the rear of the 26th Army of the Southwest Front, has the right to check the documents of all soldiers travelling in the band of the 26th Army and the civilian population to detain and check the passing carriage and vehicles, all those passing and passing about proper documents, and hand over to the NKVD or to his unit. All party, Soviet institutions and organizations are requested to assist. Major Vroblevsky, Commissar Avdyukin and Major Dynagano signed the mandate. So began our service in the rear of the 26th Army. On August 25th, battalions of the regiment went to the line kotsky helmyazovo zolotonosha located on the highway leading from Kiev to Cherkasy, 50 kilometers east of the Dnieper. For protection was allotted a section of more than a hundred kilometres. The headquarters of the regiment was located in the centre in Drabov. In the rear of the 26th Army at this time, spy signallers were particularly active, operating mainly in the areas of supply stations Zolotonosha and Grebenka. As soon as military echelons arrived there, it became known to the enemy. The troops had no time to unload German bombers appeared. Echelons came usually at night, Spy signalers directed airplanes at targets with rockets. The damage from this was quite great. In addition, agents spread all sorts of rumours, sowing panic. Border guards quickly got used to the tasks assigned to them by the command. With the support of local party and Soviet organisations, as well as with the active help of villagers, we eliminated many enemy reconnaissance groups. Soldiers and commanders did not know sleep and rest, performing their new duties. They combed forests. Gullies, fields, went out to the task at every signal. Once in the evening our platoon was in a small village somewhere not far from Grebenka station. The whole day before we had been combing the forest in search of suspicious persons, and the soldiers were quite tired. But no sooner had we settled down than we heard the rumble of engines. German airplanes were approaching, and at that moment a red rocket flashed over the station, followed by another one. Explosions shook the air. Something caught fire in Grebenka. The sky was illuminated by the flames of the fire. All night the platoon searched for spies' signalers. Border guards combed the fields, forests, asked people in the villages, finding out if there were no intruders, but to no avail. Already at ten o'clock in the morning we approached some village, stopped at the last hut. We announced a halt. And then a woman came up and said, Comrades, since morning I was working in the city, and when I was returning I saw two men on the road. 
When they saw me, they hid in the sunflowers. It seemed strange to me. Where did you see these men? Just over there, behind the village, she said, pointing away from the road. The woman led us down an alley into a field. The border guards quickly cordoned off the sunflower crops and began to comb them. Soon Pisakin and Elisiv found two men lying on the ground. They, however, also noticed the border guards and rushed away. They had to open fire. The unknown men stopped. One was tall, broad-shouldered, with a tanned, almost bronze face, about thirty years old. The other, on the other hand, was small, puny, a teenager. When asked why they were in the sunflowers, the older man replied that they had come for necessities. Why did they run away from the fighters? They were afraid, the man said. We thought they were not Red Army soldiers, we had never seen such caps. Do you have any documents? Of course. And the brute put his hand in his pocket and took out a certificate. It said that he and his son were being evacuated to the rear of the country. That's it? That's it. The damned Germans bombed our train. All the documents were burned. Here came border guards Dmitriev and Makarov. Comrade Lieutenant, we followed their trail. Look what we found. Dmitriev held a Walther pistol in his hand and Makarov held a bag with ammunition. Is this yours? Not at all, the man fussed. Why do we need it? But no matter how locked up the detainees were, their accent gave them away. According to the certificate, they were residents of Zitomir region, but they spoke like Hutzels from Prykarpatia, and I knew their accent well. But they could not explain their accent. The detainees were handed over to the appropriate authorities, where they confessed that they were launching rockets at the station on the Germans' assignment. And indeed, after that, no more rockets flashed in the night sky over Grebenka station. In a short time in the rear of the 26th Army border guards brought the necessary order. It seemed that at last there was calm, all the more that the order came to settle down with the platoon on the farm Kovrai. We defined the areas within which we were to organise the service. This small farm, drowned in the greenery of gardens, was located somewhere in the triangle of the cities of Dubny, Gribenka, Zolotonosha on the bank of a winding, with marshy banks of the river. Kolkosniki welcomed us cordially. We came to the farm on a warm and quiet Sunday afternoon. The platoon just arrived border guards of some outposts of the 4th Commandant's office, headed by Senior Sergeant Dibidev. On such an occasion, the villagers organised a dinner in the garden, and since most of them were women, after dinner there were dances. The warmth of the August day, the silence. The dancing couples reminded that Saturday evening at the outpost, when Ivan Bayev played the harmonica, and in the morning Maxim Sklyer said that terrible word war. Now the war has been going on our land for over a month and has managed to take away Maxim Sklyer, Ivan Bayev, and many of our fellow soldiers. People continued to have fun, and I, as well as then, in the last evening before the war, set the task to the outfits, only now going out to protect the rear of the 26th Army. The situation at the front, however, was unfavourable. The enemy managed to force the Dnieper near Kremenchug and Cherkasy, as well as to bypass Kiev from the north. Hitler's troops covered our armies near Kiev in a semicircle. We knew nothing about it and continued to serve, but we could guess about something. In the evenings we could hear the artillery cannonade in our deep rear, there were glows of fires, no, it was not like bombing. It was an echo of a brutal ground battle. And once border guards Makarov and Dmitriev, having seized the moment, asked me, Comrade Chief, there is something very strong cannonade in our rear. Are the Germans bombing so continuously? First, I wanted to avoid answering. But then I thought that if I didn't tell the truth, the soldiers would lose faith in me as a commander. So I told them my assumption that there is a battle in our rear. And we think so too, Makarov said. Yesterday we were on duty on the road and heard the machine gun crackle. That's how the machine guns of German tanks beat. In the morning a liaison arrived and passed the order to leave the village. We moved towards Drabov. There was fog in the ravines. The road, winding through the steppe, went beyond the pink line of the horizon. 
Some birds chirped carelessly in the dust by the roadside. We were walking, not knowing what was ahead of us. On September 7th, south of Kremenchug, the Germans suddenly forced the Dnieper and large motorised and tank forces pounced on one of the regiments of the 297th Infantry Division of the 38th Army. The enemy dismembered the division and rushed northward in the direction of the towns of Korol and Lubny. In this situation, the enemy could not be allowed to surround the backbone, the main forces of the southwestern front. However, in the reserve of the front commander, General Kerponos, there were only two very few rifle divisions of the 26th Army, which had been in battle, and they could arrive in the designated area, according to the most optimistic forecasts, not earlier than September 14th. By this time, the enemy had forced the Dnieper and near Cherkasy and the advanced units from the tank group of General Guderian, increasingly covering the troops of the front from the north, approached Konotop and Romy. On September 8th, Major Vrublevsky received an order from the headquarters of the 26th Army urgently cover the threatened directions along the Orchitsa River to Lubny. The regiment was raised on alert. However, to concentrate it on the specified boundary was not easy. Battalion headquarters received the order by radio. Further, everything depended on the diligence of the foot messengers. The closest to the regiment headquarters was our battalion. We could reach the Orshitsa River in due time. The other two battalions were at a considerable distance from the town of Lubny, and we could not count on their quick help. At first, only the headquarters units and the regimental headquarters were moved to the town. Due to the lack of transportation, our rear units remained in place in Drabov. Thus, the regiment found itself in a difficult situation. Part of it was on the march, the other part remained on the former lines. Almost all food and ammunition were in Drabov, and then it became known that the Germans were advancing not only from the southwest in the direction of the Orjitsa River, but also from the south, from Koral. Having received the order to go to the Orjitsa River, the battalion units went on their way. Our platoon was also heading there. On September 9th, in the afternoon, we arrived at the company's CP in Lazaki. Company commander Captain Rikoff read out the order, which stated that the company should take the defence near the village of Savintsi on the east bank of the Orjitsa and not allow the enemy to cross the river. The rest of the day and all night, making only short breaks, we marched. In the morning, we entered Savintsi. Captain Rikoff ordered to take a circular defence. Lieutenant Simonov was sent for reconnaissance, Taking a boat from the locals, Simonov crossed to the other side of Orshitsa. A thick fog hung over the water. It was quiet. Simonov returned in two hours and reported that the Germans were approaching the river. We prepared for battle, but the enemy did not appear. Apparently Simonov found the enemy's advanced units, which did not cross the Orshitsa. By evening Captain Rikov gathered the platoon commanders. During the day he tried to call on the local telephone line with the battalion headquarters, but failed to do so. Having consulted, we came to the conclusion that it was more advantageous to take the defence near the village of Chiraviki, where there was a bridge across the river. This was done. The company moved to Chiravichki. At night a contact came to me and told me to come to Captain Rikoff immediately. Here is what, Lieutenant Pajev, he said, handing me a piece of paper folded in four. This report must be delivered to the battalion commander, Captain Korolkov. Here is our location, and where the Germans were found. I ask the commander to give instructions on what to do next. Is that clear? Understood. But where to find the battalion headquarters? Scour all the villages up to Lubin. If you can't find the battalion headquarters, look for the regiment headquarters. Taking with me border guards Makarov and Volkov, I went on my way. In one of the villages we asked the chairman of the collective farm for horses. He gave us a guide a boy of about 14. During the day we rode around a dozen settlements, and finally in the village of Nizhny Bulatitsi, we learned from the locals that the border guards were concentrating in the town of Lubny. Leaving the horses and the guide, I, Makarov and Volkov moved along the bottom of a deep gully that led to the town. About midnight we found ourselves on the outskirts of Lubny. We knocked on the outermost house. A man came out and when asked if there were any border guards in the town, he shrugged his shoulders uncertainly. Then, apparently having got used to the darkness and seeing green caps on us, 
he said more kindly. Yes, yours are in the school. Go there. Through the dark streets we moved in the direction indicated by the landlord. About halfway there we were stopped by an imperious shout stop. Pass from the intonation. From the way the words were spoken, it was clear that we had run into the border guards. We identified ourselves and asked how to find the regiment's headquarters. Without answering, the patrolman ordered us forward. A few blocks later, a two-story school building appeared. The room was in semi-darkness. A smokestack flickered in the long corridor. The doors to the classrooms were open. On the school desks sat and lay border guards. Here were also civilian people, Soviet and party workers of the city. Having sought out the chief of staff of the regiment, Major Dienigo, I handed him the report of the company commander. The major asked me to wait. About ten minutes later he returned and said that I was called by the regiment commander. In a small room by the light of a kerosene lamp sat Vrublevsky, Avdyukin and an unfamiliar military man with four sleepers on black buttonholes. This was the district military commander of the town of Lubny, Colonel Parapelkin, who at that time performed the duties of the commander of the combat area. He did not stay in this position for long. After Lubny was occupied by the Germans, he was recalled to the army headquarters. Further leadership of the area was entrusted to Major Vrublevsky, Looking at me, Vrublevsky said. Tell Captain Rekov let the company continues to be on the occupied line. Interact with the neighbouring company of your battalion, which is located in the village of Iskovsi. If the situation changes, you will receive the necessary instructions. Then, turning to Major Dienigo, the regiment commander ordered to allocate to the company several boxes of bottles with a flammable mixture. Captain Gerba, head of the artillery armament, loaded them on the car. We also climbed into the truck and moved to Chirovichki. Meanwhile, the situation at the front was getting more complicated. By the end of September 13th, there was no solid front line. The gaps between our armies and corps were rapidly increasing. Enemy formations and units rushed into them. On September 12th, the Germans occupied Koral. Battalions commanded by Captain Bertsev and Captain Tatyanin were still on the road, and the enemy was already on the approach to Lubny. In Lubny we arrived in the evening, told political officer Lavrov, the headquarters and political department of the regiment, were located in the school. In the morning we were raised on alarm. The regiment commander Major Vrublevsky ordered us to move to the outskirts of the city, in the area of two wooden bridges over the river Sula, and take the defence there. The nearby railroad bridge was defended by a unit of the NKVD, internal troops, commandant's platoon, communicators, staff and political staff of the regiment immediately left for the specified area. At 6am, German vehicles with infantry appeared on the other side of the river and tried to break through the bridges. We met them with strong rifle and machine gun fire. Hitlerites went back behind the river. Then they began to fire at us from mortars and artillery and again rushed to the bridges. We delayed the infantry and three tanks jumped over the bridges and broke into the city. Having learned about what had happened, Major Vrublevsky ordered the regimental duty junior political officer Sidorenko to gather everyone who was in the headquarters clerks, liaison battalions and companies, and destroy the tanks. Not far from the school Sidorenko's group met these tanks. Border guards threw bottles of flammable liquid at the lead vehicle. However, the following tanks opened machine gun fire, and it was impossible to get closer to them. German tankers also did not dare to act further without infantry support and withdrew. Sidorenko with his group advanced to the river and consolidated there. German tanks settled on the bridge, and on the other bank were concentrated armoured personnel carriers and vehicles with machine gunners. At that time Captain Bertsev's battalion appeared on the northeastern outskirts of the city. Bertsev was ordered to support Sidorenko's group and knock out the Germans from the bridge across the Sula. However, the Nazis under cover of heavy artillery fire also tried to force the river. Captain Bertsev's battalion counterattacked the enemy, knocked out of the city his advanced units, says one of the documents, but repeated attempts to attack the German tanks on the bridge were not successful. The frontier guards lacked artillery. By the end of the day, Hitlerites pulled up new units in Zasuli. Twelve tanks and infantry pounced on the battalion of Captain Bertsev and the group of junior political officer Sidorenko. 
Border guards resisted desperately, but the forces were unequal. At this moment in the area of the tobacco factory arrived battalion of Captain Tatyanin. The commander of the regiment put it into battle from the start. Counterattacking the fascists, the border guards set fire to two tanks, but were stopped by the fire of the fascists. The situation could not be changed. Under the pressure of superior enemy forces, the battalions withdrew, and by the evening consolidated north of Lubin. Only the border guards, led by junior political officer Sidorenko, could not withdraw. Cut off from the main forces, a handful of fighters continued to fight. The fighters managed to set fire to one more tank, but the rest, bypassing the burning vehicle, continued to climb forward. At the critical moment of the battle, when all the bottles with fuel mixture were used up, Sidorenko took the last reserve box. The politric was noticed by fascist tankers. One after another machine gun bursts hit him. Several bullets hit the box. Sidorenko was wounded in the stomach. From the ignited bottles on his uniform jacket caught fire. Border guard Yudin tore off the burning clothes from the political officer and bandaged his wound. The fascists were rushing forward. There was nothing to hold them back. No ammunition, grenades, bottles with incendiary mixture. Exhausted from loss of blood, junior political officer Sidorenko ordered the surviving soldiers to leave the battle, and together with the border guard Yudin remained to cover their withdrawal. I woke up, recalled Sidorenko, in a shed near some mill. Next to me lay wounded like me. The fascists appeared. They loaded us into cars and took us away. Having gone through all the horrors of Hitler's concentration camps, junior political officer Sidorenko survived. In total, an infantry division, supported by about 50 tanks, was advancing on Lubny. The fascists bypassed the city and, in fact, surrounded the regiment of border guards, which stood in their way. So we were in a double ring, because by the end of September 15th, the 17th German Field Army and tank group of General Kleist, near the town of Lokvitsa, joined the second tank group. Among other units of the southwestern front were in this sack and the border guards of the 94th Border Guard Unit. True, at that time we did not know about it yet. The regiment was ordered to defend the town of Lubny, and the border guards acted based on this task. Major Vrublevsky decided to withdraw the companies of our battalion from the Orzhitsa River and cover the main forces of the regiment from the east. Sergeant Ostokov, the gunnery master of the detachment, came to us on horseback and told us that the company should arrive in the village of Novaki. We walked through the fields, sticking to the road to Verkny Bulatitsi. Everywhere we heard artillery firing. The closer we came to Verkny Bulatitsi, the clearer was the firing. Suddenly shells began to burst around us. We had no time to take shelter in the woods when we saw German tanks coming straight at us through the wheat field. It was so unexpected that at first we were confused. Then someone had the saving idea to set fire to the field. Under the cover of fire and smoke we got away from the pursuit. In the village of Novaki we were already waiting for Avdukin's assistant on Komsomol work Peter Leitishev, whom I knew from Slavuta detachment. He was a sociable, cheerful man of about 27. Leitishev explained to us that the regiment had been forced to leave Lubny and now its battalions were entrenched north of the city. Our company was ordered to take the defence at the fork of the road near the village of Klepachi and cover the main forces of the regiment from the east. Why from the east? asked Rykov. The Germans forced the sealer and were in our rear, replied Peter. Here you will be on their way. We must move to Klepachi immediately. Leitishev told how to get to the place, and the company moved along the forest road to the looming in the distance height. When we approached it, we saw a windmill spreading its wings. A village peeped through the dusk a little farther away. That was Klepachi. No sooner had we started to entrench than we heard the noise of engines. Everyone became wary. Could it be Germans? To prepare bottles with incendiary mixture ordered Captain Rikoff. An armoured car appeared on the road. It leisurely approached us. We can already see the distinctive signs. Ours. We came out of our hiding places. The armoured car stopped. A general got out. Where is the headquarters of your regiment? He asked. And who will you be? Rakov asked. 
Please show me your documents. I am the commander of the 6th Rifle Corps, Major General Alex Eve. I need to see Major Vrublevsky, commander of the Border Regiment. Having checked the general's documents, the company commander assigned him an escort. The armoured car rolled on. While we were entrenching ourselves, an armoured train approached Lubny from the direction of Pariatin. Then, along the road followed vehicles with guns attached to them. Captain Rekhoff organised the guard service and allowed people to rest. We began to lay down. It was quiet in the forest and in the village. However, somewhere behind Sula rockets were flying now and then, illuminating low clouds with greyish light. Occasionally there were explosions and the muffled crackle of machine gun bursts. At dawn the cavalry platoon of the regiment arrived in Klepachi. Where is Captain Rikoff? asked me platoon commander. And why do you need him? I have to hand over the package. Come on, I'll pass it. Without getting off his horse, Gorbunov held out the envelope. Well, take care. Where are you going? The order is to be in Tishki, ahead of you. Vesely spurred the horse, and the platoon galloped down the road. I handed the packet to Captain Rikoff. Bring up the company and line up the men, he ordered, having opened the envelope. Rikoff read the order. The order said that in accordance with the decision of the representative of the command of the 26th Army General Alex Eve, September 16th, the regiment at six o'clock in the morning goes on the offensive to the city of Lubny with the task of seizing the bridges across the River Sula. We are supported by an artillery anti-aircraft division and an armoured train. The attack is further developed by the 186th Art Regiment and a marching battalion from the 26th Army. The general believed that here broke through only weak advanced enemy units recalls about our battle in Lubny in the book, so began the war marshal of the Soviet Union I. X. Bagramian, and therefore decided to attack first, and in front of his small detachment were large forces of Kleist's tank army. The enemy of course repulsed the attack, then moved tanks, and Alexeyev's detachment did not have a single anti-tank gun. However, as the detachment did not retreat, soldiers and commanders fought fiercely. So for the first 90 days of the war, the border guards of the 94th Detachment had to stand in the way of Kleist's tanks. But that morning, when Captain Rikov read out the order to attack, we, who were not privy to the plans of the High Command, did not realise the entire strategic situation on the southwestern front, and were preparing only to repel the bridges occupied by the enemy. The fog was still floating in the ravines, and the artillery division and armoured train began artillery preparation. After the first volleys, the regiment of 400 and a little soldiers went on the offensive. Our battalion, which had about 120 men left, under the command of Captain Mikhail Mirziashvili, the representative of the regimental headquarters, left the edge of the forest near the village of Klepachi and began to develop the attack in the direction of the bridges over the Sula. Two companies of the battalion, with which Captain Mirziashvili was directly with, were advancing along the rye field. Our company, led by Captain Rikoff, was advancing towards the village of Olshanka. At first the battalion quickly went down the mountain by the forest road. But as soon as the forest ended, Captain Mazyashvili turned the border guards in a chain. It was about a kilometre away from us. Soon the crackle of machine gun bursts, rifle shots, the distant rumble of engines, the dry sharp blows of mines reached us. There the battle had begun. Our company was advancing along a gully along a muddy, quiet river, overgrown with thick yellowed reeds. Then the gully widened. Ahead appeared several squat huts stretched along the steep bank. It was Olshanka. Suddenly the sentries signalled to stop. A man of about forty-five years old was brought up to me. Comrade Chief, this citizen does not advise us to go further. I asked the man to show his documents from which I learned that his name was Sava Avramovich Ishchenko and that he was a collective farmer from the village of Olshanka. Why are you, father, agitating not to go to the village? The Germans are in the village, comrade commander. They have tanks. What can you do if you have only rifles? Go to the forest, father, I said, returning Ishchenko's passport, 
and don't disturb us. We have received orders to knock the Germans out of the village, and we are obliged to do it. I met with S.A. Ishenko in 1967 when I visited Olshanka again. During the rally on May 9th, an old man who had seen the sights came up to me and said, Hello, comrade commander. Remember, over there, behind the village in the meadow, when you came out of the forest and turned around to attack Olshanka, I met you and said, where are you going? The Germans have tanks there. But you went. We embraced and went to the place where our first meeting took place so many years ago, and then, having passed the meadow, we found ourselves in the marshy floodplain of the river. And then a German machine gun struck from the village. Comrade Lieutenant, the machine gunners are on the bell tower, one of the soldiers touched me by the sleeve of my uniform. I give the command everyone to concentrate fire on the enemy machine gun. But the fascists hid behind a stone wall. Just do not take them. And then Sergeant Mikhailov, border guards Schleichtin, Volkov and Makarov, clinging to the cliff, crawled to the church. I want to shout go back, but I realise that there is no other way out. We intensify the bombardment of the bell tower. Mikhailov and his men successfully get to the rear of the enemy machine gunners. From the cliff, the border guards shoot the Hitlerites. Machine gun Germans no longer interfere with us. The company goes to the line of units of the battalion. Ahead is already visible Sula, and the cherished goal of our offensive, the bridges across the river. Over the water is fog, and the bridges seem to float, then appear, then disappear again in a milky shroud. In the city we hear shooting, explosions. This battalion's Birdsev and Tachanin are trying to dislodge the enemy who has settled there. Captain Mazyashvili hurries us. Forward. Forward. For some reason the Hitlerites in our area do not make themselves known, as if they were not here at all, but we felt that they were near, lurking, waiting, keeping us in their sights. The reconnoiter was the first to come across the enemy, and immediately the enemy fire fell on us from all sides. From the opposite bank of the Sula struck artillery and mortars, and from the city from the heights enemy armoured vehicles and large calibre machine guns. The rumble of gunfire and explosions was eerily joined by the rumble of tank engines. It could be heard from somewhere behind, from the rear. Everyone who has bottles with fuel mixture to the road. Captain Meziashvili commanded. I see him running with a bottle clutched in his hand to the place where German tanks are about to appear. With a roar, the cars burst out onto the field. Disguising themselves in the grass, bushes, using the uneven terrain, the soldiers are waiting for the head tanks to approach them. Bottles fly. Dozens of creeping fires break out. This delays the enemy onslaught for a while, but there are no more bottles. And then our cannon hits the Germans. We do not know where it was and why we have not heard anything about it, but this support is just in time. Captain Mirziashvili's voice is heard. Tack, forward. It was a desperate attack, which is hard to forget even after more than 30 years. Former assistant platoon commander Vasily Lebedev recalls this battle as follows. I remember well how the enemy machine gunner at the church blocked our way. I was ordered with a group of fighters to bypass the firing point and destroy it, I, Sergeyev, Fedorov, Mikhailov and several other border guards advanced to the target through thickets of reeds. But the further we went through the swamp, the harder it became to walk. The mire seemed about to swallow us up. A little to the left, where our platoon was, there was some noise. Then there was a command for the motherland. Forward. And a decisive hurrah we heard frequent firing. Then it subsided and suddenly resumed with even greater force. And then someone shouted loudly beat the bastards we only heard the noise of the battle, but could not see what was going on. It was impossible to move forward or backward. Large calibre machine guns were beating from the bushes on the western bank. They were literally mowing dry reeds. Mines slam, fall and burst. The swamp is gurgling, gurgling. With noise and clanking Nazi tanks burst into Olshanka. The rumble of gunshots, bursting mines, machine gun and machine gun bursts shake the river floodplain. One day I received a letter. Alla Grigorievna Mikatilova, a pioneer teacher of school, no. Three in the town of Lubny wrote we ask you to arrive at the Moscow City Komsomol Committee by 10 o'clock on March 28, 1970. We are specially going to Moscow, 
so that the participants of the defense of our city handed the students of the seventh grades consumol tickets. The day before I was ill, I felt bad. But how not to fulfill the request, not to meet with the children who came from Lubnan Shina, the land of which is abundantly watered with the blood of the border guards of our unit. In the morning I took a solid dose of medicine and went to the city Komsomol committee. There I asked where I could find the children who had arrived from the town of Lubni. A tall, slender man came up and said in a very pleasant voice I'm looking for them too. It was the former platoon commander of the 125th Artillery Regiment Fyodor Lontievich Nenko, whose battery supported us in the battle near Lubny on September 16, 1941. Then in one of the halls of the historical museum Lubnia schoolchildren were given Komsomol tickets. They promised that they would honourably carry through their lives the precepts of the great Lenin. We looked at the joyful faces of young men and girls sitting in front of us, and remembered how then, in the harsh time in September 1941, the same Komsomol members, perhaps only a year or two older, fought a brutal, unequal battle with Nazi invaders near the town of Lubny. Yes, the fight was both cruel and unequal, but nothing could not break the fighting spirit of fighters, their impulse. Selflessly fought with the enemy and border guards of the 10th Outpost, Department Commanders Mikhail Igorenkov, Alexei Sargiev, Kapostin, Privates Alexei I. Kretinin, Sergei Mikhailov, Peter Elisiev, and many others. On the swampy floodplain of the rivulet, flowing into the Sula, we again got out to the edge of the forest, from where we began our offensive, and lay down, hoping that perhaps someone else would come up here. Shots were still rumbling in the city, grenades were bursting. What to do next, combat? Rakov asked Captain Merziashvili. What do you mean, haven't you heard the order? It is clearly said to get through to the bridges. Here will come the artillery regiment and marching battalion, and we will start again. We were lying at the edge of the forest waiting for the artillery regiment and marching battalion, not knowing that neither of them would ever come to us again. Only later it became known that the regiment and the marching battalion were attacked by enemy aircraft and suffered heavy losses. It took a long time to put these units in order. The moment of surprise was lost. General Alexeev gave the regiment an order to return to the original line Vasilenkovo field. Our company advanced to the village Krugliki and covered the roads from Novakov, Olshanka and Klepechi. This crossroads was located northeast of the village Krugliki, in the area of the forestry. During the withdrawal of the regiment, the enemy tried to break into the defence area on the shoulders of the border guards, but the fire of the armoured train and artillery division blocked the Hitlerites' way. Besides, Vasilenkovo field was covered by an anti-tank ditch and enemy tanks could move only by roads. Hitlerites began to concentrate for an attack in the area of the monastery. The half-ruined monastery stood on a hill not far from the city behind Olshanka. That's where several dozens of tanks were piled up. Having turned in combat order, they slowly crawled to the positions of the regiment. The whole field was covered with bursts. Our artillery batteries and guns of the armoured train responded to the fire of tanks. On September 16th, Hitlerites repeatedly attacked the defence of the regiment, but each time, encountering the steadfastness of the frontier guards, strong fire of the armoured train and art division, they rolled back. At night, the armoured train and artillery division supporting the regiment withdrew to Piryatin, to the headquarters of the southwestern front. Now it was left to count only on themselves, on grenades and on bottles with flammable mixture. All night the border guards were preparing for the fight with the enemy they strengthened dugouts, dug communication passages, equipped observation points. All ammunition was strictly accounted for. Commanders and political workers were always among the soldiers, supporting in them a high fighting spirit, the desire to stop and destroy the enemy at any cost. The morning of September 17th was warm and windless. As soon as the horizon turned pink, the armada of armoured vehicles moved from the monastery. Artillery volleys shook the morning air. It is from somewhere hit the positions of the regiment German howitzers. Approaching the dugouts and trenches, opened fire enemy tanks. From the side of Klepachi and Novaki villages we heard rifle and machine gun fire. It was difficult to understand what was happening there. But then several horsemen from Lieutenant Gorbinov's cavalry platoon jumped out of the forest. They shouted something on the move. 
from which it was possible to make out that the Germans were behind them. Having spurred their horses, the cavalrymen galloped to the area of the command post of the regiment. Soon the others showed up. Among them a cavalryman of our outpost, Sergei Tsipin. His left arm was bandaged and hung on his belt. It turned out that at dawn the Germans forced the river Udai and attacked the cavalry squad of Lieutenant Gorbunov. The cavalrymen repulsed the machine gunners and in a mounted formation began to pursue them. But at the edge of the forest the cavalrymen were met by a tank ambush. German tankers at point-blank range hit the cavalry platoon with their guns. Your Zaletny, comrade chief, was hit by a shell, and I was hit in the arm, said Tsipin, as if apologising for not saving my horse, which I gave him when he went to the cavalry squadron. Permission to stay with you now? On the situation created, every fighter counted, Sipin stayed.